Hello, my name is Carlo Giacometti and my, the title of my presentation is Speech Analysis, Processing and Synthesis. I will talk about uh, upcoming functionality in Mathematica relating to speech, mainly classification and processing. The first thing I want to show is actually the last thing in the list, the synthesis. We have upgraded uh, our speech synthesize uh, function to get slightly better quality results and a wider array of, of voices. So just, you know, wow. Okay, forget this. Uh, evidently, <laughs> there is some serious problem there. Um, <laughs> Whoops, sorry about that. Let's see if this works without too much effort. Haha, <laughs> yes. Um, so this is one example. Golden key in the lock, and to her great delight, it fitted. Okay, so we have improved the... Um, I probably am in the wrong build. Ah, well, we'll see how this goes on. We have improved the range of voices and we have improved the quality of the synthesis. We do now accept uh, uh, all the options that a spoken string takes. So you can actually have uh, an audio object uh, of a, a, mathematic a generic Mathematica expression, not only a string. About analysis and processes, one function that will be coming is speech resynthesize. So the, gener the general idea is that you can parameterize a speech recording into a limited set of uh, parameters. Then you can manipulate these parameters and resynthesize a signal from the result of your operation. So speech resynthesize has a variety of modes of operation. We have some preset uh, actions, for example, pitch shifting. You might say, so we already had the audio pitch shift function. That, that does a fairly decent job. This is the original signal. Right then, perfect timing. And here I am just shifting uh, by five semitones down. Right then, perfect timing. Now, what happened here is that the whole uh, signal has been shifted down, not only the fundamental frequency of the speech, but also all the formants. The formants are uh, uh, frequencies that depend on uh, the physical characteristics of your vocal tract and, and your whole uh, vocal apparatus, I guess. Uh, so what you really want to do is to shift the fundamental frequency of the signal, but keep the, this formant information intact. And this is what speech resynthesize can do. Right then, perfect timing. And it is uh, uh, lower in tone now. Right then, perfect timing. But as you can hear, the voice is... Right then, perfect timing. Only the pitch changed without changing the characteristics of the voice. Similarly, for time stretching, this does change... Right then. And, and similarly, you can do the same with speech resynthesize. Right. You, 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 you see how it goes. Um, I mentioned before that you can shift the fundamental frequency without affecting the formants. So what about instead just shifting the formants without affecting the fundamental frequency? So what I want to do is maintain the pitch at which these words are being spoken, but I will shift the voice quality. This is something that wasn't possible before in the language. So I won't guarantee the result will sound particularly good, but... Right then, perfect timing. Okay, this is a fairly innocuous shift, but if we do something slightly more dramatic... Right then, perfect timing. The pitch is maintained, but the quality of the voice is completely changed. Now, these are presets. They can get old very easily. Uh, the nice thing about speech synthesize is that uh, we are designing a syntax that allows more uh, user customizable uh, operations. In this case, and, and you can operate on the various components 
uh, namely the fundamental frequency of the signal, the spectral envelope of the signal, and the aperiodicity component of the signal. So here, I am doing a targeted modification to the fundamental frequency. Right then. Perfect timing. And you can uh, write whatever kind of pure function to do these kinds of modifications. If you want to dig deeper into what is going on, we are planning, so this function is uh, experimental. I will not promise the design will be exactly the same when it will be released. But we will, um, we will have a way of grabbing all these parameters and let the user manipulate them. So here I am asking for the speech synthesized data of our initial signal. And as you can see, the information I get is fundamental frequency, spectral envelope, aperiodicity, and then some just parameters for how to uh, build up the synthesis again. And the convenient thing is then you can inspect these parameters. So speech resynthesize is not only a tool to get a sig an audio signal out, it's also a very good tool to uh, do analysis of speech signals. Um, so this is how a fundamental frequency signal looks like. We can look at um, spectral envelopes and we can look at the aperiodicity component. So this gives us information, as I said, about the formants of the signal. And this gives information about the transient, the non-periodic transients that happen on uh, consonant-like sounds. And we can manipulate all this information and just put it back together and get back right, our perfect timing in this, in this case. So just a quick mention about speech recognition. We will have a function that does that. At the moment, the current implementation is seriously lacky, lacking. And we will have a much better implementation based on neural networks, but the timeline for that is a bit longer. I, again, I will not promise exact dates, but uh, it is in the works to have some very good uh, speech recognition function. So other things that you could do uh, about analysis and processing of speech signals is uh, using some functionality that was already in the system, for example, audio local measurements. So I don't know if you are aware of the vowel diagram. Here we display several vocalic sounds and uh, their position in this two-dimensional space is very much uh, defined by the position of the formants, which, as I said, are these resonances of our vocal tract. Um, so what I will do here is uh, first grab a collection of these recordings, e, a, e, etc., etc., and I will use audio local measurements to compute these formants. As you can see here, it's it's enough to specify that I I do want the formants corresponding to a signal. And let's see if this works. This is a short ex except of them. As you can see, it's two formant frequencies, which is what we need to reproduce this diagram. A and our goal is to reproduce it programmatically. So we don't know anything about what these uh, vocalic sounds are. We just know um, formant frequencies. And we can plot them. This might take a little while because it has to display a lot of audio object. And so let's see if the distribution that we got here actually um, is similar. So at the top left, E, we do get an E. And here we, U, U. Ah, excellent. So we kind of reproduce this kind of sound. A, O, E. And yeah, as you can see, we have reproduced in a completely programmatic way without any knowledge about phonetics, the vowel diagram. A new function that is coming is audio distance. And uh, here the idea is a measure of how similar two signals are. So here I have a collection of recordings of the first sentence of Alice in Wonderland. Alice was beginning to get very tired. Et cetera, et cetera. Alice was beginning to get very top. So different speakers. Alice was beginning to get Alice was beginning to get very tired of si Have a very different voices and they have a very different prosody, which is how fast they are uh, reading essentially. Well, not 
exactly, but that is one of the factors. And I will compute here a distance matrix of all the signals by using audio distance, and I will use inside audio distance, um, I will use a warping distance, which is uh, some distance, distance measure that will take into account a variation on the specific timing um, of the signal. And this will give me information about which signals are more similar. And in this case, I can see that signal uh, one and signal four are the most uh, different. Alice was beginning to so get very tired. A woman that speaks fairly uh, quickly. They're sitting by her sister on the bank. A male that speaks slowly. The second one is also very different from uh, the first one. Alice this is was a male that speaks very, very slowly. Tough. Instead, the two most similar ones are the second and the third, which are, I guess, the two male uh, speakers. So this can give us some insight into uh, not only speech signals, but generic signals. And I'll just as a, a nice visualization, I am computing the uh, distance matrix between all the data in our audio example data collection. And this will give us information about which samples are the most similar to each other. This doesn't give any quantitative, quantitative information at the moment, but it is a nice visualization in this case of our uh, audio data example collection. Now, a lot of analysis and processing these days, as you have seen, I'm sure, in, uh, in this conference, can be done with machine learning. And we are uh, significantly improving our machine learning framework in the sense that now uh, having audio as an input rather than images or text uh, or numbers will be fairly straightforward. So here I have a data set of recordings of specific commands like no, yes, down, et cetera, et cetera. Something that if you were to build a small robot and you would try and control it with your voice, this could be uh, some commands that you would like for your um, robot to be able to recognize. So, yeah. Off. Up. So, fairly straightforward. Uh, you, you can imagine how this goes on. Down. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, just a note, in all uh, the machine learning examples I will give, I will use this kind of ugly uh, utility function to uh, extract some features from the audio signal. Now, what we are planning to have in 11.3 is an audio net decoder that uh, will be incorporated in the neural networks without the, using, the user having to worry about this. So uh, it will be much more streamlined, essentially. So what I will do here is I will compute the MEL spectrum, which is kind of a non-linear remapping of the usual spectrogram. Um, I will compute this feature on each of the input samples. These are, uh, if you're interested, the parameters that uh, will be used. Um, but uh, probably a more practical way to look at this is to look at some plots of these MEL spectrograms. So the vertical axis here is time, and the horizontal axis is frequency. So, sure, this is a bunch of example um, uh, features that the neural network will see. So what I do is construct a simple um, neural network. It just has this, if you are wondering what are the reasons why I chose this ar architecture. This is an architecture that has worked very well for image processing tasks. And given that the input I am, uh, I am feeding to the network is a two-dimensional matrix, uh, I end up using the same convolutional structure that is very fast and produces very good results in image processing. I will skip the training part, which uh, nonetheless didn't take too much time on my machine. So this is something that if you download the data set, uh, which is, I think, several gigabytes, it still took no more than half an hour on my machine, only CPU, not GPU, to train. 
So this is something that every one of you could do locally without having to uh, go on clouds and stuff or buying a GPU or stuff like that. So as I said, I will skip the training. I will import the pre-trained net. And I can look at the results. It might take a little while to oh, compute. OK. And as you can see, just with half an hour of training on this machine without any fancy stuff, the network is very basic. You could definitely come up with a, a more a convoluted model. I still get very good accuracy. So this is validated on the training data. And this is the result of the validation on the test data that the network has never seen. I get a 90% accuracy. And as you can see, most of the mistakes is um, the network misclassifies any input to the other category, and, and which is fairly understandable. Uh, all the other classes correspond to a single word. The other class correspond to every other word. So that is the main source of, of error in the network. So as I said, this is an easy way to uh, do some machine learning on audio, and it is possible on your laptop without any additional effort. And you could export uh, the resulting train network to run on small devices. Another example still in the machine learning um, um, kind of thing is uh, speaker separation. So this is a very tiny data set. This is a more a, a proof of concept example rather than something you would use. Uh, it, it has spoken digits. And the two labels in the data set are which digits is, is being spoken and which speaker is uh, pronouncing the digit. So in this case, Seven. we have Nicholas. Three. And still Nicholas. We have only three speakers, unfortunately. As I said, the, data, the size of the data set is very tiny. So what I will do here is compute the mill frequency sepstyle coefficients for all the data set. Um, and this is about, I think, 600 um, uh, files on my hard drive. I am computing it now. And this is done. So. Uh, this is what we will be adding in the net encoder function. You could use that to batch convert a bunch of audio files that you have on your hard drive onto features. In this case, mouth frequency sepsal coefficient. This is still, for those of you who don't know, you still get a two dimensional image per each audio signal. And if you want to look how this looks like, it's kind of similar to the uh, mouth spectrogram, but the information is kind of uh, mangled around. So what can we do with this? We want to classify these. And uh, by the way, this information was extracted by the training data. So what we can do is just use classify, feeding just this malfrequency self-style coefficients directly to classify. The user doesn't have to do anything, know anything. And classify will do the thinking for us. Let's look at the information about the classifier. As you can see, this classifier that was chosen automatically by the system is using gradient boosted trees. If any of you knows exactly what it is, I don't really know. Uh, but you can see it gets a very good accuracy on our training set. Now let's see how this, this fares on the training data. 84%. So sure, it could be improved. but with essentially zero effort from the user, we still get a very good prediction uh, by classify. Now, how can we, what is a potential strategy to get better results at this? So what we could do is, of course, train another network. But in this case, I wanted to try something slightly different. I will show you what the example is. Whoops, not that. Wow. Still not good. Sorry, there are some problems with the batch size being small. Sorry about that. Anyways, the idea is that I grab two random samples in my data set, and I attach the label 
which is true if the speaker is the same, or false if the speakers are different. So now I am not telling the network, okay, this input belongs to this speaker, this other input belongs to this other speaker. I am just telling these two are the same or these two are different. So this is the input data for my problem, for my new problem. And what I do is I define a single speaker net that is exactly the same that we looked at for the speaker commands. So this takes one uh, speaker as an input, but then what I do using that net map operator, I map this net onto the two inputs that I was talking about. And then I want to classify if this is true or false. The crucial part here is that the branch that looks at the first speaker and the branch that looks at the second spe speaker are exactly the same network. They share the same weights. So in the training, it's not like this will learn one speaker and this one will learn a different thing. They are exactly synchronized at every step. So this is the final network. So this is the operation that lives inside it that is mapped on the two inputs. I will also here skip the training and import the pre-trained net. And we can look how this goes, how this fares in terms of recognizing if two speakers are the same or not. Very well, of course, on the training data. Uh, slightly less well on the testing data. So what was the overall goal of this? Just to say if speakers are different? No, what I can do is now I can extract the net that was uh, processing one of the two inputs and use this as a feature extractor for uh, my recordings. As you can see, this is, as I said, a normal convolutional layer, some convolutional layers, but the output is not uh, a class. It's a vector of 100 elements. And what we hope is that this vector of 100 elements uh, manages to capture some of the characteristics of the speakers while leaving behind the information on what is being spoken. And uh, what, what was done during the training is a set of test features from th three speakers were uh, monitored, um, sorry, the output of the net on a set of test features uh, was monitored as a function of the training time. So we start with a fairly random distribution. So the, the various colors belong to the various speakers. So yellow is one, green is another, the, uh, blue is the third. As I said, this was a 100 long vector. This has been uh, re uh, reduced in dimension with dimension reduced to 2D so we can plot it in a two-dimensional space. At the beginning, all of the speakers are completely intermixed. But we can see that as the training progresses, the three speakers are clustered in different areas of the 2D plane. And we end up, if we fast forward to the end, you can see that there is a very nice separation about the green speaker, the yellow speaker, and the blue speaker. Now we can um, use the, these features that we have extracted, this 100 like vector, as a new input for classify. So I am doing just that, computing um, uh, the result of this net onto the input that we looked at before. If you want uh, an example, we can get a random sample of these features. It's a collection of 100 length vectors that goes to a label that identifies the speakers. And we can run classify again onto this data. same parameters, performance, goal, quality. If we look at the classifier information, now we get an accuracy of 100%, of course, on the training data. Uh, now we can um, compute some test features and look at how this classifier now behaves on data that it has never seen. Okay, not 100%, but still about 10% better than the classifier that we used that didn't have this uh, nice feature extractor that we built. So this is how by merging kind of a, a custom neural network and 
uh, and completely automatic classify can be used um, applied to uh, speech and audio related problems. That was it. Thank you for listening. This is the team that has been working on the audio processing side.